I've used the ideas from this book to create a mental model, a framework, a latticework, a web of over 100 different book notes and a thousand different ideas. I've created book notes on things like habits. I've created book notes on things like learning and focus, all of which we're going to be talking a lot about here today. But the reason I've done this is because I believe the reason to good and efficient creating, writing, creating videos or other content lies in the intelligent organization of ideas and notes. And this book is going to help people from all different backgrounds to get more done, to write intelligently, to think about their learning for the long run. It's going to teach us how to take smart notes and ensure that they bring you and your projects forward. The principles here are tried and tested, and they're a note-taking technique. Not only does this book explain how it's going to work, but also why. Instead of wasting your time searching for notes, for quotes, and for references, you can focus on what really counts, which is thinking, understanding, and developing new ideas in your writing. This system, inside of How to Take Smart Notes, is based off the legendary Zettelkasten method, developed by Nicholas Luhmann, who was a 20th century sociologist who also published a prestigious amount of work, 70 books and more than 400 articles before his death. You can see that today we're talking a little bit about habits, we're talking a little bit about goals, we're talking a little bit about learning here today and talking about focus as well. Getting a little bit more granular, the first idea that I pulled out of the book of the six is preparation, not IQ. And to sum it up, the quality of a paper and the ease with which it is written depends more than anything on what you have done in writing before you even made the decision on the topic. But if that's true, and I wholeheartedly believe it is, and the key to successful writing lies in the preparation, it also means that the vast majority of self-help books and study guides can only help you to close the barn door correctly and according to the official rules, not just a moment, but many months after the horse has already escaped. With that in mind, it's not surprising that the single most important indicator of academic success is not to be found in people's heads, but in the way that they do their everyday work. In fact, there is no measurable correlation between a high IQ and academic success, at least not north of 120. Yes, a certain intellectual capacity helps you get into academia, and if you struggle severely with an IQ test, it is likely that you will struggle to solve academic problems too. But once you're in, a superior IQ will neither help you to distinguish yourself nor protect you from failure. My reflection here is that the perfect example of fixed versus growth mindset and how that hinders our ability in everyday life. Of course, this book also speaks mostly about academia, which is not something I'm familiar with, but nowadays a lot of us are knowledge workers and responsible for creating work. What I recommend here is to check out Mindset by Carol Dweck. For just more information on fixed versus growth mindset, I think it's definitely worth checking out and I've got a whole entire mind map on it that I'll link for you down below. The too long didn't read at the very beginning of how to take smart notes is just knowing that IQ, which is something predetermined for the most part, is not the major factor in determining our success, even when knowledge and learning is a key component of what it is we do. So what is the key component? Well, people like Angela Duckworth and Martin Seligman did some research and they said, Self-discipline and self-control is what really is going to be the thing that dictates whether you're going to be successful or not in many different ways. Now, I, I've also done book summaries on Duckworth and Seligman, so if you're interested, go and check those out. But that's something you can check out at a later date. Something that might sound even scarier, but, uh, you know, the, this like self-discipline and things like that might sound like, oh, I wish I could just rely on my IQ. But truly, this just means that everything else we've learned on this channel, things like how to set good habits, how to set goals, how to have a little bit of discipline, those are all going to play a key part in our success, as well as having a good system for taking notes, which is something we're going to talk about. And I think that's very empowering. It's not something fixed, but it's something that you can actually have an influence on that's going to dictate your success. Next, we're looking into Nicholas Luhmann. And one quote that he has inside the book I never force myself to do anything I don't feel like. Whenever I am stuck, I do something else, which I think is something great to aim for. We also think about in 30 years, he published 58 books and hundreds of articles, translations not included. Many of them became classics in their respective fields. 
Even after his death, about a half dozen more books on diverse subjects like religion, education, politics were published in his name, based on almost finished manuscripts lying around his office. There are many more than a few colleagues that I know who would give a lot less to be half as productive in their whole lifetime as Lumen was after his death. A good structure allows you to do that, to move seamlessly from one task to another, without threatening the whole arrangement or losing sight of the bigger picture. Writing is not a linear process, and we constantly have to jump back and forth between tasks. It wouldn't make any sense to micromanage ourselves on that level. But he collected his notes in a slip box, in such a way that his collection became more and more than the sum of his parts. His slip box became his dialogue partner, main idea generator, and productivity engine. It helped him to structure and develop his thoughts, and it was fun to work with because it worked. So that's the story of Nicholas Luhmann, one of the pro most prolific academics in modern history. But really, it's less about Luhmann and how much of a genius he is, and it's really about the system that he's created and is using, or has used, sorry, to be so prolific. It's kind of like, if he can do it, so can I story more than anything else. The main ideas here, for me, are that writing is not a linear process. If you're bored or not interested in something, you won't do your best work. And it doesn't mean that you should stop altogether. Just find something that you are interested in. And I think that's why this map is so great for me. If I want to learn about something in particular, of course, I can dive in and look into that topic. Like if I wanted to learn just about habits, I could pull this out. I could learn a little bit more about focus. I could learn a little bit more about habits, whatever one I decided to grab on that day. But if focus or habits are boring me or there's no good books in that area that I want to think about, I've got all of these different ones that I could click and kind of choose my own adventure to find different things. Specifically with someone with a little bit of ADHD, this is a really good way to do it. By collecting notes, creating collections, we can create something much larger than just a collection of our notes. So for example, I've been doing a question and answer period. Uh, there's a form down below if you want to fill out a question. I'd be happy to make a video for you answering your question. And what I do is I lay this out. I've got all of these thoughts, all of these ideas. And what I do is I put your question to the system. I go out there and I find the answers that I think most reflect what would be helpful for you in your situation. So I definitely think it's worth you going out and either checking out those videos that I'll do on the channel or also submitting your own question. Potentially, I'll be the one answering the question for you. So our next idea here is just about the slip box manual. How do you use the slip box of Nicholas Lumen? Strictly speaking, Lumen has two different slip boxes. He's got a biographical one, bibliographical one, which contains the references and brief notes on the content of the literature. And the main one in which he collected and generated his ideas, mainly in response to what he read. The notes were written on index cards and stored in wooden boxes. And whenever he read something, he would write bibliographic information on one side of the card and make brief notes about the content on the other side. These notes would end up in the bibliographic slip box. In a second step, shortly after, he would look at his brief notes and think about their relevance for his own thinking and writing. He would then turn to the main slip box and write his ideas, comments, and thoughts on a new piece of paper, using only one for each idea and restricting himself to one side of the paper to make it easier to read them later without having to take them out of the box. He kept them usually brief enough to make one idea fit on a single sheet, but sometimes he would add another note to extend a thought. So the idea of the slip box here for me is really revolutionary. Often we try and take notes in a singular context and think that it's going to be helpful for us to remember something. But we can think of this process like the mind maps I'd done before. Each one was great on their own, but it really had no connection to the other mind maps, meaning it was a good exercise to try and remember something for me, but just not all that useful to all of us when we're trying to create something useful out of the content. Now, with the slip box method, which I'm using Obsidian for, this is, the, I, this is the tool that I'm using, I take all of these notes in the same place. They can be connected and drawn from at any point in time in the future without much friction. There's also something to be said, I think, for two different types of note taking. Bibliographic is like taking quotes and authors that I highlight from the books. These are easy and quick to take down, and there's something that you can do as you're reading and not interrupt your workflow. 
The next piece is like reflections or putting things into your own words. And this is something that they talk a lot about inside of Make It Stick. I recommend you go and check out that book if you haven't already looked at it. They talk about how putting something in your own words is a really powerful memory tool. But now coming from how to take smart notes, it also gives us this chance to think about how the work fits into our greater view of the entire system. And of course, this is absolutely what we're trying to do with our map as well. It's just, okay, what are the main ideas of learning? What are the main ideas of potentially habits or different things like focus and things that I want to know, what are the main ideas and what's connected to it? So I want to create my view of the world and I'm doing that through these content maps, which are the light blue nodes as well. So the next piece we're talking about is just the process of taking smart notes. Probably this is a big piece of what we're thinking about here. So the process is really five different steps. The first one is to make fleeting notes. Always have something at hand to write with. Capture every idea that pops into your mind. Don't worry too much about how you write it down or what you write it on. These are fleeting notes, mere reminders of what's in your head. They should not cause any distraction. Put them on one place and which define as kind of your inbox and process them later. The next is to make literature notes. So whenever you're reading something, make notes about the content. Write down what you don't want to forget and think about what you might use in your own thinking or writing. You want to keep it very short, be extremely selective, and use your own words. Number three is to make permanent notes. Now turn to your slip box, of course. Go through your notes that you made in step number one and two, ideally once a day before you forget what it meant, and think about how they relate to what is relevant for you and your own research, thinking, and interests. Step number four is to add your permanent notes to the slip box by filling each one behind, filing each one behind the other one, and etc. We won't go over that too much because everyone's going to be using their own tools. But number five is just to develop your own topics, the questions, the research, and think about it from uh, bottoms up, from within the system. See what's there, what is missing, and what questions arise. So this is actually a tool that I've created as well. This quote really kind of just speaks for itself, no matter what tool you're using, it's the process of taking smart notes. But let me explain how I do it a little bit in each one of these steps. Step number one is to make fleeting notes, of course. And this for me looks like reading or listening to a book and highlighting the important points from the book that I think would make it into my summary. This is great because it has the ability to store it inside of the cloud as well, and it really limits the friction that goes on. Step number two for me is the ebook reader actually allows me to take small notes with each highlight as well. And I use that section to make any connections to the previous ideas that I would want to remember when I move into step number three. Step number three is when I copy the highlights into Obsidian and I add my own reflections in, I organize them. I try to do six to eight points per book. Step number four is luckily I can do steps number three and four together with Obsidian as it has a really great interlinking system, which is the map and the graph that you're seeing right here. I just linked one page to another and I can easily see it inside of the graph and move around as I see fit. Step number five is to moving more towards now. So instead of just book summaries, I'm going to be trying to bring full topics and answering questions and forming my own arguments via the notes I've already created. Actually, a quick plug for that, how I read and summarized 100 different books is my very first kind of exploration note, I'm going to call them. So that's something that you can check out on the channel as well coming up. So our next idea here is just the tools for taking smart notes. So there are really four different things we wanna keep in mind for taking smart notes. Getting the tools ready shouldn't take any more than five to 10 minutes and ideally it's built right in as it is with my system. But having the right tools is one part of the equation. It is easy to get fooled by their simplicity. Many have tried them out with out really understanding how to work them and were expectedly disappointed with the results. Tools are only as good as your ability to work with them. And I can say that it took me quite a long time to figure out exactly how I wanted to get Obsidian to work for me. You need something to capture ideas whenever and wherever they pop into your head. Wherever you use, whatever you use, it should not require any thoughts, attention, or multiple steps to write it down. The system, the reference system has two different purposes, to collect references and the notes that you take during your reading. 
the slip box. Some prefer old fashioned pen and paper version to a wooden box, and that's fine, but computers really can speed up a relatively minor part of the work in the equation anyways. Things like adding links and formatting the references, of course, the thinking and the creating is the hardest part here. Finally, the editor. And we won't talk too much about that, but luckily Obsidian does both. Not a huge plug for Obsidian, but it is a cool tool. There isn't that much that you truly need to take smart notes. The paper notebook and a flashcard might be the best option for you, which is great. I would say, however, there are a few tools that I personally like to use for each of these steps. The first step, I use two different tools. First, I use an audiobook player, and I know that's blasphemy to some of us out there, but this allows me to take in information at any time on the go, which is great for me. However, it's not great at creating notes or capturing thoughts. So I actually also have an ebook version that I use to highlight and take notes in at the same time on the same device, whether I'm using my phone or an iPad or something like that. Step number two, the ebook reader I use usually has the option to pull up my highlights and notes all in one section. So I pull that up and I use that as my permanent reference guide when I'm coming into step number three, which is the tool that we're in right now. And it's essentially my slip box, Obsidian. It's an amazing way to capture both references and reflections, as well as organize my notes in a way that makes sense to me. Step number four is Obsidian really covers this step as well, without much need to think about it. It's using a markdown editor, which may take some time to learn if you're not familiar, but it's really a friction-free way to write and to format. So definitely recommend checking out that process. The next idea and the final idea actually is to think inside the box. Creativity cannot be taught like a rule or an approach to a plan, but we can make sure that our working environment allows us to be creative with ideas. It also helps to kind of keep the mind uh, helps to keep in mind some creativity, creativity inducing ideas about problem solving that might be counterintuitive. It is worth it to dwell on this subject a little bit before we move on to the next step, the preparation of the rough draft of the manuscript. The real enemy of independent thinking is not external authority, but our own inertia. The ability to generate new ideas has more to do with breaking old habits of thinking than coming up with as many new ideas as possible. For obvious reasons, I do not recommend thinking outside the box. On the contrary here, we can turn the slip box into a tool for breaking out our own thinking habits. Our brains just love routines. Before new information prompts our brains to think differently about something, they may take the new information to fit into the known or let it disappear completely from our perception. Usually we don't even notice when our brains modify our surroundings to make it fit its expectations. We need, therefore, a bit of a ruse to break the power of thinking in routines. So my reflection on this is that thinking in routines is the way that our minds are set up because we've got billions of bits of data coming at us every single day. This is great, of course, because it means we're not stapled to the couch thinking about how weird it is that the entire universe is, you know, constantly right above us, right? We're floating on this convertible, which is really weird. But as far as coming up with truly creative work, not so good for that. Well, it's different because your brain is completely on autopilot. So Sankey points out here, an inversion on a common phrase might be the best way to go. And also I recommend you go and check out inversion. That's coming from the, the book by Shane Parrish, The Great Mental Models, volume number one, talks all about inversion and how you can use that to spur new ideas. So in here, thinking outside the box is worse than thinking inside the box. So now we've got all these ideas, these references, these notes, and it's the process of taking those notes, making the references and doing your reflections, but then letting the box come up with the ideas, the connections and the path for your writing and creative work. For me, now to create a video, all I need is a spark of an idea, which for me, there isn't any shortage of while I'm reading. And then I can find multiple connections, even if they seem completely unconnected, and create a completely new video in under an hour. That's the true power of taking smart notes. So those are the six big ideas. Preparation, not IQ, Nicholas Luhmann, we've got the slip box manual, we've got the process of taking smart notes, the tools for taking smart notes, and think inside the box. 
Now we're going to go into a couple of different tools. The first one is just the process of taking smart notes, which we already have gone over. But I also want to talk about something from Jim Quick called the faster model and then digital distraction, breaking your addiction so that you can actually put into place any of these ideas. So the faster model is number one. So we've got the faster model here. We've got the acronym standing for forget, act, state, teach, enter, review. So I really like this model. And the whole idea is essentially what you need to do here is follow this faster model. And I won't go over each and every single piece, but the way I used to do this is before each mind map and while reading, I do two things. You got to turn off your phone and forget all of the distractions. While I'm mind mapping, that's actually the process of learning or while I'm building these notes, that's my process of learning. For the state, I always listen to music while I'm writing down my notes. But as I'm reading, I never listen to any music. The next thing is teaching. And of course, that's what these videos are for. Next is entering. So these videos are the perfect example of entering. Each week, I'm committing to making one video. So you want to enter something into your calendar. And the next one is review. So this is what the beauty of kind of how to take smart notes actually is for me. It's essentially just saying, okay, you know, I'm, I'm making these notes, but now I have a way to reference it. Now I have a way to come back and essentially relearn things, right? Revisit things. And that's extremely important as well. So it's important to have a place in your notes where you can revisit and relearn things again and again. The next tool that I wanted to talk about is digital distraction. And this is something, of course, that's coming from Cal Newport. And you're more than welcome to join the, join the channel and get these tools all for yourself. But how do we break digital addiction? Really, it comes in three different steps. Number one is set up some rules. Some example rules are don't have social media apps on your phone, turn off your notification, and set up site blockers on your work computer. Those are three good rules. The next piece is find other things to do. Don't sit around and stare at a wall. Instead, find things that you enjoy doing that don't involve technology. Number three is to schedule your usage. Of course, if you're not going to step away 100% from using technology and break that digital addiction altogether, we want to make sure that we are scheduling time blocks where you are going to use social media intentionally. So definitely worth checking out there. I really recommend that you join the YouTube channel get access to the tools, get access to all of the different tools that we've created. Every single white dot here is a new tool that you can implement in your life coming from some of the world's best authors. That was How to Take Smart Notes by Sonki Ahrens. Really, really thank you for being with me here today, and I hope to see you in the next one.